Welcome to this new episode of The Context. I want to talk to you about sustainability in a thermodynamic sense. Thermodynamics is the physics branch studying uh, systems uh, from a statistical point of view as they evolve through time, through their inputs of energy and how their behavior uh, can reflect emerging phenomena that we well understand uh, in uh, our day-to-day -day lives, but that uh, can be derived from understanding the microscopic behavior of these systems. So, for example, we talk about the pressure of a gas, uh, but this pressure can be derived through uh, the motions of the individual molecules uh, composing the, uh, the gas, and we can anticipate how the pressure is going to change if, for example, we increase the temperature in uh, the chamber where we are measuring the pressure. Now, when we talk about sustainability, uh, what uh, we uh, represent mentally, what we imagine is um, a system typically pretty complex, where we want to achieve some kind of equilibrium, some kind of balance between the inputs and the outputs. And we want to uh, preserve the structures that have emerged in this system because we attribute value uh, in them. And, and as a consequence, we want to uh, see them going forward in time. The paradox is that there are basically no uh, closed systems that uh, uh, exist in the real world uh, and that uh, open systems are subject to an evolution that by definition negates the perfect balance that would be required if we were to talk about sustainability. As a consequence, we can only talk about sustainability in a very limited sense, in a given area or volume, in a given interval of time. But as soon as we get out of that uh, set of parameters in space and time, we will observe that uh, the system actually that we believed was sustainable is not anymore. Now, the conclusion of this uh, reasoning that uh, I will illustrate uh, through examples uh, soon shouldn't be that sustainability uh, is a fallacy by itself or that it should not be pursued. It, it means only that the ideal simplistic representation of sustainable systems that can be easily replicated and adopted, whether in uh, our approach to um, understanding ecological systems or in how we design and uh, implement and modify and incentivize economic systems, uh, should be improved should be informed by a deeper understanding of what is and is not possible in the real world. So uh, we look at uh, uh, planet Earth as the preeminent example of sustainability. Uh, we admire the complex uh, and well-balanced um, ecology, the biosphere, uh, that uh, Earth uh, supports. And right there, uh, we can instead uh, uh, see a, a, a very large number, an, a, an uncountable number of, of examples of how that uh, uh, system itself is, is not uh, sustainable. Um, it is enough to, to start from the largest uh, time intervals and to understand that, yes, uh, Earth uh, started 
uh, four billion years ago, more or less, and in a few billion years, um, it is going to be destroyed by uh, the sun becoming a giant uh, red star uh, that uh, will engulf uh, Mercury, Venus, and Earth uh, itself. And as we understand its evolution, it will stop around or before the orbit of Mars. So whatever Earth uh, is doing, it is doing it in a specific time interval of, let's say, six billion years. Plenty of time, admittedly, but still uh, its sustainability has limits. Within this time interval, the life forms that constitute the Earth biosphere uh, have started relatively modestly uh, in uh, uh, the oceans, but even then they have uh, catalyzed processes that had dramatic disruptive changes uh, on practically every, every component of uh, the Earth system. Oxidizing uh, metals, precipitating um, the uh, uh, dissolved metals uh, in the, um, uh, in the uh, oceans, exactly because uh, uh, the uh, oxygen byproduct of uh, uh, life uh, enabled this oxidization process and made uh, the, the water in the oceans transparent. They were not transparent before. And through the water becoming transparent, it enabled uh, photosynthesis uh, at a deeper depth that not just a very shallow um, millimeter um, level than before. Um, the very minerals of uh, rocks in the Earth crust uh, are a consequence of uh, microbiological life working on uh, these uh, rocks uh, for billions of years. Not all of them, but many of them would not be possible without uh, life. The uh, atmosphere itself is in a constant state of uh, thermodynamic uh, disequilibrium. It is far from uh, being chemically and thermodynamically uh, in, in a stable state. It is constantly uh, reforming uh, oxygen uh, that uh, is formed by uh, our, our plants and planktons and, uh, and uh, this oxygen uh, it goes everywhere in the atmosphere. 20% of the atmosphere is oxygen uh, forming uh, ozone uh, in the highest layers uh, where sunlight uh, is absorbed in its uh, frequencies where if they could uh, penetrate the rays of ultraviolet light from the sun that uh, ozone stops would actually destroy uh, the DNA chains that constitute life uh, on Earth. So everywhere we look uh, the solid, the liquid, and the gaseous uh, components of Earth are impacted by life, which is itself is in a constant state of change, far from uh, being in balance with uh, itself and its uh, surroundings. This uh, lack of uh, being in balance is what uh, spurs uh, the individual organisms as well as entire species to keep trying to survive and uh, m the vast majority of the time failing to survive. This uh, being far from equilibrium is the very basis of, of evolution. A perfectly uh, stable environment with perfectly adapted uh, organisms would cease to evolve. There would be no reason to uh, evolve. It will never push itself uh, outside the boundaries of its biological comfort zone. And 
So per definition, uh, even though we are look at nature, we are looking at nature uh, as if it embodied uh, our ideals of uh, sustainability and, and, and balance and equilibrium, um, it indeed represents uh, the, the very opposite. There are complex interconnected uh, processes that uh, mutually support the uh, ecosystem. And these processes can be uh, made more robust or can be impoverished or even interrupted. And uh, when we uh, observe uh, that, uh, for example, um, tens of thousands of years ago, uh, the, the Sahara Desert uh, was uh, green. Uh, well, uh, that is uh, the observation of um, a, a vast environment uh, dramatically changing. Uh, or uh, we could go even farther um, back in time and look at Antarctica, that rather than being covered by a kilometer uh, deep ice sheet, um, was uh, covered with forests. Or we could go back uh, in time still further and uh, stop at uh, the ice ball age of planet Earth when the entire planet was covered uh, with ice and life uh, could survive only because of the freak accident uh, that our universe exhibits that water is one of the very, very few substances we know where the solid state is lighter than the liquid state. So this ice that covered Earth actually protected a liquid layer uh, where life uh, could, uh, could survive. Uh, imagine if that were not the case, uh, ice would form uh, from the bottom of the oceans and keep growing, growing, growing until uh, all of the water was frozen and uh, uh, life could not uh, survive under those conditions. So the processes of uh, entropy and the processes of uh, complex structures far from uh, equilibrium are intrinsic to uh, cosmology, um, planet formation, geology, biology, and pretending that we can and we should form um, human-driven activities that, contrary to all that precedent, can implement and preserve perfect uh, um, systems that are uh, sustainable in the sense that their inputs and outputs are in balance with each other while expressing complex structures uh, inside uh, is profoundly misguided. We have to recognize that starting from the principles of physics, starting from what it means to exist in our universe, the complexity that we observe, we require in order to exist, and that we express in our activities as we form societies, uh, uh, economies, and as we uh, look out in the universe to try to understand more of it and to hopefully form complex systems outside of the gravitational boundaries of uh, planet Earth itself, these complex systems will be necessarily and in perpetuity far from equilibrium. They will not be um, fundamentally sustainable. They will always operate uh, in a state of striving to preserve themselves and oftentimes failing to do so. Now, the uh, ability to uh, understand how a system can react 
when under the stimulation of its environment uh, it is moved outside of the boundaries that previously it would comfortably and lazily uh, pretend to control, uh, that is uh, of fundamental importance. And of course, in the past, the systems themselves had feedback mechanisms in order to preserve their um, characteristics, uh, their identity, the, 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 their recognizability. But these feedback mechanisms were relatively limited uh, because uh, there wouldn't be any kind of look ahead uh, with which the systems could recognize future states that could put them outside of uh, those boundaries where they could find the trajectory to bring themselves back uh, into a, 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 a state where they would be recognizable. There could be stimulations that pushed the systems so much outside of those uh, uh, zones of existence in their fundamental parameters that there was no way of going back. And the lack of these uh, uh, look-ahead uh, abilities uh, is uh, what causes, uh, for example, biological uh, evolution to be so incredibly wasteful because it is completely unable to uh, create uh, systems that uh, recognize if they are heading uh, in a dead end. The, the classic uh, myth of the lemming um, uh, migration uh, that uh, just pushes uh, thousands or millions of individuals off a cliff uh, is a metaphorical representation of the blindness of uh, uh, purely biological behavior. And it is appropriately contrasted with the human ability to um, plan, uh, to forecast, to uh, observe future states and to classify them and to label them and to understand that certain behaviors, certain um, uh, characteristics of the trajectory uh, of the complex systems uh, that, uh, that we can observe and model uh, are to be uh, minimized because they would lead uh, to uh, the destruction of the complex system itself. So uh, we plan, we plan uh, for the future of ourselves as individuals, uh, of our cities, societies, and we should uh, do that uh, planning uh, much more effectively, uh, taking full advantage of uh, all the tools and all the systems that uh, we have available. Uh, when you hear some uh, accrued wis wisdom uh, to express uh, that um, history always repeats itself, uh, that we uh, cannot learn and, and cannot improve. Uh, uh, that is a, a very defeatist uh, position of uh, people and, and, and wizened uh, old uh, sages who have actually given up, uh, who have uh, um, renounced uh, the hope of uh, perfectibility and, and uh, whether individually or as societies, uh, that leads to uh, a self-fulfilling uh, uh, prophecy where uh, the uh, lack of uh, trust in uh, the ability uh, of the individuals to improve themselves and of societies to evolve in positive directions um, becomes reality uh, because it uh, reinforces those behaviors uh, that instead should be kept in check and, and minimized uh, if, uh, if at all possible. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, we are also uh, in a situation where there are a wide variety of uh, uh, beliefs, behaviors, uh, uh, and uh, expectations towards the future. So, uh, even though uh, there could be some parts of um, uh, the planet that uh, fall into this defeatist trap and uh, ends up destroying itself, uh, as of today, 
uh, there is enough variety across uh, uh, the planet to hopefully uh, that not happening uh, everywhere. Now, it has been the case that uh, a lot of the biological processes uh, were local and their expansion on a global scale would take a long time. Uh, when uh, oxygen, free oxygen, wasn't available on the planet, we already had life forms that uh, didn't need it for their own metabolism. Uh, anaerobic uh, bacteria constituted uh, for more than a billion years uh, the only life forms. And paradoxically, because the uh, product of their metabolism was oxygen, they were uh, excreting it rather than absorbing it. Uh, we uh, are the result of the end game between uh, anaerobic life forms and aerobic life forms, where the second ones won and the first ones lost uh, their dominion over the planet. Uh, they still exist uh, in um, niche environments where oxygen is not available. For example, in uh, deep ocean volcanic vents uh, where uh, they receive the heat and the energy from these uh, volcanic sources uh, and uh, lacking oxygen, they are the only ones that uh, can uh, uh, survive and thrive in, in those environments. But on the surface, uh, the, the uh, current uh, generation for the past uh, three billion years uh, is uh, the aerobic uh, organisms uh, using uh, oxygen. So the past uh, uh, transformations where this passage has uh, certainly required uh, um, hundreds of millions of years uh, for the anaerobic to aerobic uh, uh, war to, to conclude. Um, today, instead, we are in a situation where um, very, very rapidly we can have effects uh, on a global scale. The uh, Industrial Revolution with uh, uh, large amounts of CO2 emissions uh, has changed uh, the uh, chemistry of the atmosphere, producing uh, acid rains uh, in, in many parts of the globe. Um, and as we reduce the sulfur content of the carbon we burn, those acid rains uh, disappeared and forests could um, once again flourish. Uh, but CO2 itself uh, still represents a, a, a problem because we are producing too much of it. And yes, CO2 has always been part of the atmosphere and natural processes both produce it as well as absorb it, but it is enough to have a little bit extra uh, every year. And just like when you eat too much and you get fat and you didn't realize um, day after day, week after week, month after month, but in the course of a year, uh, you gain uh, maybe uh, two, three kilos. And in the course of 10 years, you become obese. And then uh, your metabolism, your organism starts to break down. Similarly, uh, even though over the course of a single year, the extra CO2 we emit uh, in the atmosphere may not be excessive, um, the fact that it keeps accumulating leads uh, to uh, a potentially fatal breakdown uh, of uh, processes that we need in order to survive. Um, another um, dangerously uh, uh, fatal or, or, or potentially fatally dangerous uh, global effect that uh, human civilization must keep uh, uh, minimizing uh, is, of course, um, the uh, uh, eruption of a nuclear uh, war on a global scale. Um, there are many movies that uh, have been 
um, uh, 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 written and then and then shot around uh, the fall of the uh, Soviet Union uh, when uh, uh, the uh, previously united um, nation of the Soviet uh, republics divided into independent states. And there was a period uh, when uh, many of these states ended up having on their territory nuclear bombs uh, that uh, uh, the world uh, didn't trust uh, the local uh, governments to uh, uh, safe keep uh, or even uh, not to fire uh, in an act of uh, uh, crazy grandeur. Um, and these movies uh, would represent uh, those crises that could develop uh, uh, given um, the chaotic uh, years uh, after the breakup uh, of, the, of the Soviet Union. Currently, uh, all of the bombs uh, are under uh, Russian control. But um, uh, have there been scripts uh, and have there been scenarios of uh, what would happen if uh, the United States uh, broke up and uh, uh, various uh, states uh, uh, in more or less chaotic uh, situations would end up uh, having on their territories uh, nuclear bombs? The situation is completely different, of course, uh, for many reasons, uh, political, uh, geopolitical, uh, ethnic, uh, um, uh, of governance, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, whether uh, the United States uh, is uh, on a trajectory of decline and it is going to be able to get out of it, uh, or whether it is going to end up sunsetting as, as uh, the last empire of the 20th uh, century, unable to cope uh, uh, with the, the challenges of the 21st. Um, it is certainly true that a global thermonuclear war is something that uh, would put uh, human civilization outside of the bounds of what is able, what it is able to withstand and recuperate healthily from. Uh, how much uh, uh, this is concrete, let me illustrate it with uh, maybe the, the, the last example of our open systems and uh, permanent changes in our environment that uh, these uh, open systems uh, uh, represent uh, in their unsustainable uh, transformation. When technological human civilization started, let's say, just to make it simple, 10,000 years ago, uh, as it went from stone tools to bronze tools to uh, um, ever more um, um, uh, technologically evolved applications of metallurgy, it could count on the accumulation of these metals uh, in uh, what uh, we then labeled our mines uh, through hundreds of millions or billions of years of uh, um, geological and uh, biological processes that, that uh, made it so that these metals would be um, in, in, in a relatively small place in a very high percent of, uh, of, of the, the earth uh, crust. And so we would uh, mine the ores that we would then refine using fire and other processes into um, plows and, and swords and, and everything else we, we needed, nails and hammers and so on. But if we would have to start over, not so much luck anymore. All those mines are exhausted. Today, in order to extract minerals from the Earth's crust, we have to resort to ever more sophisticated uh, processes because the richest of the veins, 
that uh, 10,000 years ago, with the technological tools we had available then, we could, we could take advantage of those richest veins are gone. So if we were to start over, we would not be able to build the kind of civilization that uses metals in order to bootstrap itself through agriculture in produ producing food that enables uh, a percentage of the population to invent writing, to invent the scientific method, to invent uh, philosophy and all the things that uh, we leverage today for our current civilization. Would we be able to find an alternative way of achieving it? Maybe, maybe not. Let's not find out. So, to conclude, sustainability uh, is a goal that we have to recognize is unachievable. It has never been achieved anywhere. It is always just a limited outcome of a space-time bubble that we observe and we admire, but we cannot count on it. We have to strive constantly in a never-ending uh, uh, quest uh, as our open systems through uh, the uh, uh, inputs of energy produce uh, the outcomes we desire. Uh, if you want to learn more about this topic, uh, an incredibly powerful starting point uh, is represented by the works of Ilya Prigozhin. Uh, Ilya Prigozhin was a, a Russian-born uh, chemist who won the Nobel Prize for dissipative uh, systems and dissipative structures studying the thermodynamics uh, uh, and, uh, and entropy and uh, how uh, open systems can generate uh, structures uh, countering uh, the uh, entropy increase that would suggest that these structures would break down and, and, and uh, be gone. So I hope uh, you enjoyed this and uh, I will see you in the next episode of uh, The Context.